Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am very excited for another episode of the Industrial Real Estate Show. And this will be a special episode because not only do I have an amazing guest coming on, but we're also going to be giving away some really cool things. Uh, we're going to give away four books. Uh, I'll talk about those real quickly as well. Uh, two copies of Creating Trinity, uh, which if you remember, I had Gary Chesson, the author, on to talk about this phenomenal book. Uh, I highly recommend it. Darren's going to be giving away two copies of that book. We're also going to be giving away two copies of Justin Smith's book uh, called Industrial Intelligence, which I've uh, recommended in the uh, book, in the video I did on books on industrial real estate. Darren's also giving away two of those. And then I'm also going to give away a small uh, industrial real estate pack, which is which has an industrial real estate coin, which we'll have to talk about on why I have these coins on another video and a keychain and some stickers and stuff. So lots to give away, but even more than the giveaway, I'm just very excited to chat with Darren because I've followed Darren's journey for the last couple of years now, and he's built up an impressive industrial real estate portfolio, even though he didn't come from having a background in industrial real estate. And I've, I've got to chat with him briefly before we started, but all of our interactions just been on social media. So I'm just really excited to get to talk to Darren, hear more about his journey, just get to know him a little bit more. And as we're going through this interview, we'll put little nuggets in there on how we're going to be doing this giveaway. Uh, so stay tuned into this and we will jump into this right now. Darren, I'm super excited to have you here, man. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Well, it's it's an absolute honor because like I said uh, at, the, at the intro, I've been following along uh, your journey from just getting getting into industrial real estate to now growing a pretty impressive portfolio. So tell me a little bit more, maybe start on, on on what you were doing prior to getting into industrial and then what got you to where you are today. Yeah. So in 2016, I got licensed as a broker. I got licensed as thinking that my path and career was just going to take me down the residential world. So I read the uh, famous book, Millionaire Real Estate Agent by Gary Keller. And that was just kind of the path of how you net a million dollars uh, in residential brokerage. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is the path set before me. It's, you know, a million dollars was uh, at that time, just a crazy amount of money. And so, um, yeah, I was like, okay, let's do it. Um, and before that, I had a background of sales. So I was in B2B sales, uh, but I wanted to work for myself. Um, and so I thought residential was going to be that path. But it wasn't until 2000, so 2016 got licensed. It wasn't in 2000, until 2017, I actually got licensed or I picked up my first investor client. And uh, before that, it was about the wall colors. It was about the granite. It was about the layout, the school district, blah, 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 blah. A lot of this emotional selling of, you know, how, how do you see your family in this place? Da, 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 all that other stuff versus the investor, which was an Excel spreadsheet. How much cash flow was it? And that was his main criteria. Yeah, that, that, you're so right on that. And and I started in residential as well back in 2004. I did a, a year of residential before moving to commercial in 2005. And I would say the same thing. There's there's definitely some emotional selling that I've found on, on the industrial side, but it, there's just a lot more uh, analytics that goes into it versus, you're right, w it, do you like the granite? Or does the house face a certain direction? So I'm with you on that. So you got into the, on the investment side, what led you to then consider industrial? Yeah. So I built up my portfolio because he kind of, what I say is sideways mentored me. So I just, uh, he, he showed me a burr cycle, single family, uh, which is buy, renovate, rent out, and then refinance and repeat. Uh, and I was just like blown away by the fact that you could recycle, uh, capital, um, didn't need a lot, or you could use maybe some hard money or creative financing at the very beginning. And so it really is kind of one, two, skip a few 9,900. I bought my first investment single family uh, on the residential side in 2017. Um, slowly kind of made the way to a full-time principal, full-time investor. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, I had about a hundred units. Um, and at that point I was looking for the commercial real estate. I thought maybe multifamily, maybe some office conversions or something along those lines, multi mobile home parks, just the things that I have, uh, that I had experience in within the residential side, but it wasn't until, uh, frankly, you know, you and a couple other influences that really opened up my eyes to the industrial real estate sector. That, that's very cool, and I'm I'm honored to have uh, to played a part in that. I think we just got went went a little bit black there for a second, so hopefully we're we're back online now. Uh, I, I'm honored to play a, a a small role in in that. So so tell me when 
you decided to get into industrial then you had a hundred units uh in residential let's even start talking about that first because that's not only is that an impressive number but that must have taken a considerable amount of management to oversee a hundred different tenants so tell me what was what did it look like managing and owning a hundred units in residential yeah, so once again, I'm lucky to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this is where I invest. So the, the cost of, of living is is very low. And same thing with the cost of uh, purchasing real estate. And so that first investment was like $75,000, which you know you couldn't buy now. Um, and so we, we fixed it up, used the burst strategy. And then what I was really chasing at that time, some of the goals was just a number. So I was on the bigger pockets uh, you know, kick. I was listening to all their podcasts, reading all the forums, and then also coupled with like some of the, 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 the four hour work week kind of stuff. I was like, okay, how do I get to this quote unquote financial freedom that I was obtaining this number or the number of doors and, and kind of going from there and hitting critical mass. And so it kind of became a game of, okay, here's the cash flow that I get, but I'm wearing all these hats, leasing agent, asset management, property manager, maintenance person on call, you know, all this other stuff. I, I don't have any time freedom. And so, it just kind of became a lever of just like, uh, hey, I have the cash flow number, but I don't have any time. So let me hire someone. Okay, well, there goes my cash flow. So we need to do a couple more and building that. So right now I have a small team and I still have the about 100 units, a little over 100 units still. Um, I have a small team, leasing agent, property manager, um, and then project manager. And then we have a couple of subcontracted crews uh, that does that does maintenance and then bigger renovations also. Wow, congrats on building so much infrastructure behind that as well. That's that's really cool. So now walk me through the first industrial investment. What, what did the process look like? How did you start analyzing the deals? Uh, and then what did you settle on? What was your first investment? Yeah, that first investment, I'll actually share about the failed one because I actually didn't believe uh, that sale leasebacks were real. I was like, why would a business actually do this uh, just, you know, coming from the lens of a uh, property owner and principal only? Why would they sell this asset? But, you know, there's obviously there's so many different reasons why a, a company would sell their real estate and then lease it back. So that first deal I was trying to do was a sale lease back. And we went through months and, of negotiation and then matching and then, hey, he didn't want to guarantee the lease, da, 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 you know, all this other stuff. Stuff. And so uh, that one actually fell flat on its face at the very, we had a verbal agreement and then he, he, he just decided not to do anything. At that point, I was once again, about uh, early 2022, I was not really sure exactly what I was pursuing. Um, and so I kind of threw anything to the wall. I, I think I bid on a hotel conversion. I also had a couple apartment complexes that I was trying to look at. And in the midst of this, the sale lease back, uh, what was, you know, one of the things that I was negotiating on. Um, I was really, really excited for it. And when I would think about it and wake up or, or try to go to sleep, you know, that was the only one that would that would give me peace. Whereas the hotel conversion was just hectic. You know, you have so many zoning, you have uh, some of the, uh, the affordable housing and some of those credits available to you. But the capital stack and all those things was just really, really crazy. Um, and then on the second part, you know, some of the apartment complexes just really, really take a lot of time and the scale and magnitude too of, you now inherit 100 new people as your tenants and you have to onboard them. Uh, the sale leasebacks uh, looked really, really great to me because it was just one tenant and it was executed at closing. Um, but yeah, that was the first failed industrial deal. I think that those stories are important to tell as well, because industrial real estate, to those looking at from the outside, they might not fully understand all the nuances and, and just behind the scenes things that happen, good and bad. So I, I, I'm glad that you shared that because a lot of people just think that you might be able to jump into it and you hit a home run on the first deal. And the fact of the matter is using that baseball analogy, you hit a lot of foul balls, you strike out, uh, you might hit a single, you might hit a double, maybe you hit a home run eventually, but it's it's that un unglamorous side of the business that does take a, a lot of behind the scenes work. Uh, so that, did that, that one ever close or is that one fully off the table now? It is fully off the table. We tried to to hit it back a couple different times. And now with interest rates uh, a little bit higher, it, it's really hard to squeeze. I think that ultimately it is a good deal, uh, especially what we negotiated. But, you know, that was at the early stages of 2022. Um, but yeah, we can transition to the first actual deal that I did. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that is ever going to come to the closing table. <laughs> well, the beautiful part about this business is that sometimes things don't manifest or come to fruition for several years. Who knows? Maybe 
five years down the road, you circle back on that uh, because I'm sure you've, you're similar to a lot of other investors uh, and brokers out there that if, as long as you're tracking things, you make a call to that guy two years down the road, who knows, maybe he's in a better position to sell. And since you've already had those conversations, who knows, I bet that, that could easily still be a deal, even if it's off the table uh, temporarily, but yeah, let's, let's actually, before we do, and let's do, let's do one giveaway here just to see uh, if, uh, if people are, are tuned in and willing to ask some questions. So the first giveaway, again, this is going to be a compliments of Darren. Uh, we've got the creating Trinity. I can't say enough about this book, D Darren, just uh, what are your thoughts on this book as well? Cause I know that you, you got it and, and have read it too. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I started, I, I wish this book was available for me like five years ago. It's just a really great comp comprehensive story about uh, partnerships, about commercial real estate. And there's probably some terminology that I didn't uh, that that maybe about a year ago I, I wouldn't really understand, but I think it's a really great story of what is available in commercial real estate as you draw things out on a decade long scale. So look at your career in 30, 40, 50 years, and it really is available and uh, accomplishable. Um, so I, I love the book, and yeah, I, I I try to give it away as much as I can too. Yeah, I'm the same. I think I've probably, I've probably given away a dozen or so of these of these books. So I'm. I, Grateful that you're giving away a couple of these. So criteria for we'll, we'll give away uh, a two right now. Uh, and it, it, this can be at any point during the interview. But the first two people to ask Darren a question in the chat, will send them a copy of this book. So again, feel free to do it at any point. But the first two people that ask a question will get it. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's jump into the first successful property that you bought in industrial. Yeah, so the first in, uh, successful industrial property that I purchased was actually uh, one that had a lease attached to it. At the time, I wasn't too familiar with, you know, uh, the vacancy rates and what was moving here in Tulsa and different things like that. So what felt safe to me was something that already had a legally binding agreement that already, you know, with with the bumps and with uh, the NOI already just kind of established. And so that was a 25,000 square foot manufacturing facility. Hmm. Um, and it had a uh, about two years left on a three year lease. And then there's one option available too. What felt safe to me is that the tenant had actually improved the property by about half a million dollars. Um, and so they it's a very high likelihood that they uh, continued the option and they actually exercised the option and lease for another three years. And so um, what I liked about it is it's kind of this interesting delta that I like uh, about industrial estate. One of the biggest things that I do is that it, it's valued on a cap rate basis. But at the same time, you know, the replacement, the replacement, the replacement cost is actually way lower uh, or way higher than what the actual purchase price was. And so that felt really safe to me in the midst of, you know, the crazy 0% interest where things were going and bidding really, really high. Um, and so that was actually a 10 cap purchase and I oh. bought it off of Craigslist. Wow. So very rare, but yes, a lot of <laughs> rare things happening uh, at one time to actually purchase that property. That that's amazing. And to think that you found that on a, an online classified site makes that even more special. <laughs> let's, let's jump into that a bit more. So you were going through the process. You already found the one that was uh, a sale lease back. And then you found this one, uh, the owner was selling it on online classifieds. How did you start the process of actually just finding deals? What did that look like for you? Yeah, yeah. So this started back in 2020, the end of 2021, I decided to kind of restart my career in commercial and actually raise capital. At that time, before previously on the residential sector, it was mostly my 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 capital. And once again, I was trying to hit the numbers that I was very almost selfishly. Um, but now, uh, as I kind of restarted the career within commercial real estate, you know, I, I'm, I'm open to uh, joint, joint ventures and raising capital. So uh, I think once again, this is a really good roadmap uh, of how you can actually get deals. One is immerse yourself in the brokerage. Uh, so, so I started attempting uh, NAOP. Uh, so there's a monthly breakfast here in Tulsa. CCIM has a monthly luncheon too. So I started just showing up and poking around. Um, and so those lunches, usually the first one is for free. And then maybe there's a, a small, you know, $20 fee or something like that. So you can join in. So I started to shake as many hands as people specialized in industrial. Um, and so anybody with a CCIM attached to their LinkedIn in Tulsa got a friend request, uh, got, you know, a, a connection request. Same thing with SIOR. I looked up on LinkedIn. Uh, SIOR, anybody with that 
uh, in their tag in Tulsa, you know, they got a, uh, a request from me to be their friend. And so I started to immerse myself in the brokerage side of things and just telling them the criteria, what I was looking for. On top of that, I was looking on a daily basis on LoopNet, uh, CoStar, and then, yeah, these weird ones, including Facebook and uh, Craigslist. Um, I have not gotten a deal yet on Facebook or Craigslist, but, you know, sometimes unsophisticated people that don't have access to LoopNet or CoStar use these uh, to, to find tenants, and they're usually just owner-operated. And so this one was for sale. And uh, so, yeah, th those are kind of the two ways that I was looking at the time uh, for, for uh, those deals. What I love about that is that it isn't complex. There, there's no secret sauce there, but it does take some elbow grease and you have to roll up the sleeves and actually go and do the work on that. Whereas a lot of in, uh, investors that might be residential or multifamily, it's more of a simple process. Not to say that it's easy, but it's more simple. Whereas on the industrial side, you, you need to just uncover all those rocks and it takes some work. But uh, I love how you said uh, those networking groups. I'm a huge advocate of NAOP. Uh, so it's used to be an acronym that stood for the National Association of Industrial and Office Properties. They dropped that acronym, uh, but, but they kept the name NAOP. And it's basically the Commercial Real Estate Development Association now. I don't even know if they have a, an official name, uh, but there's chapters in pretty much every major market uh, in North America. And it's a great group where you're getting developers, uh, affiliated professionals like architects and brokers and lawyers and property managers. It's a great group. And then like you mentioned, CCM and SIO are also great resources for brokers. So that, that that's awesome that, uh, that, that you've been able to uh, uh, get into that market by just shaking hands and uh, kissing babies. I don't know if, if maybe that, that comes in there or not. Uh, I, I see the first question came in from, from Neil. So Neil, uh, congratulations. You just won yourself a copy of creating Trinity. We have one more to give away still. So if you have another question, next person that asks a question, we'll get another copy of the book for free. Uh, Neil asks, what would you say to a residential broker that is thinking of switching to an industrial pros and cons? Yeah, so I obviously I'm, I'm very bullish on industrial. So there's a lot of different things that I love about industrial. I would say uh, the pros and cons include that you can actually work on leases, you know, at least in my city, uh, there's not a really big leasing proponent for the residential side, because you only have one year leases. And sometimes it's like, you get paid, you know, 50% of the first month's rent. And you know, if rent is $1,000, you only get made $500. Whereas for leases on the industrial side, some of them are three, five, 10, 15 years. So you can get paid not only on the leasing side, the selling side, the transaction side, there's so many different things about industrial. So I would say, uh, you know, inter, uh, you know, join those networking groups, see the people that are uh, potentially looking for a junior broker and sit, uh, hang your license with them. I think that it's really, really key to have, uh, you know, a, a, what I like to say is like a locker room style, like brokerage that is, uh, you know, not just dog eat dog and make the, make the copies, fill the coffee, et cetera, like that. Um, but someone that will actually mentor you and actually teach you, uh, not just tell you to, to drive around everywhere and show these things. So, um, that's what I would say, but yeah, I'm, you know, I would, I would say switch immediately if you like industrial or if you even have a, a tangible thought process there. So, um, yeah, that's, that's for me though. So, um, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and I've done that. I did residential for a year and switched to industrial and having an 18 year career now, I would have done it 100 times out of 100 all over again. So I echo your comments completely. And if anything, when I got into industrial in 2005, it wasn't nearly as rosy of an outlook uh, as it is today. I'm 100% with you. I'm bullish. I think that there's a long runway of, of success. Uh, so circling back to that manufacturing property. So you bought it two years left on a three year lease. They sunk 500 grand into it of their own money, which that in itself is, is a cool part about industrial because on residential, it's very unlikely that tenants will spend any money on, on their space. They won't even paint the space. They keep it exactly as it is. They don't invest anything. They move in, move out in virtually the same condition that they, they bought it in. Whereas your tenant spent 500 grand in there. So are you, is there a year left in that lease now, or where are you at in that term? Yeah, about a month. Uh, yeah, about a year left. Um, I think when I closed, it had like a little like a little overhang, but maybe a year and a half ish left on that. And uh, what I like about it, too, is even though that 
uh, it, it is specialized within the manufacturing space. So it's not like open to distribution, like high ceilings and stuff like that. But what I like about it is that, yeah, that $500,000, all those equipment, all those upgrades to electricity and lights and stuff like that stays with the property. And that, you know, the, the initial negotiation uh, was based on what was a lower uh, rental rate because of the, they were going to put in those things. And so if they don't exercise the option, um, you know, I'm actually going to be able to <laughs> increase it to probably closer to a 14 or 15 cap just based on uh, the improvements that they put into it. So it felt like a really, really safe one. Once again, um, I needed the cash flow immediately just because I wasn't too familiar with industrial. And then I wanted that upside on the back end and then below replacement cost too. So um, really like that deal. It's fun. Um, and it's just, uh, it is triple nets. So uh, it's a way different uh, style of management versus the residential style. Very much so. So then you get the itch, you see some success on it. You see that you've got a tenant that's now invested in the space. If they don't renew, you can release it at a higher rate. So now you got the, the bug. So where does it go after that way? First property, 25,000 square foot manufacturing property. What, what came next? Yeah, so this was kind of a one-two punch. Um, I'll share the story of the the next single tenant, but at the same time, I was in a six-month-long kind of back and forth with a multi-tenant, uh, uh, you know, bro uh, uh, seller. And so that the second single tenant net lease, I was like, okay, I got this deal under my belt, the manufacturing. Let me maybe try to get a larger, uh, you know, distribution space, and I kind of wanted a value-add component to it also. And so there was one that popped up on LoopNet. I, I being from the residential world, was immediately booked a showing and uh, wanted to be the first person in there, the first person to shake the hand, and then also the first person to offer onto it. And so it came uh, at a very low price point per square foot. Um, and it was just a really weird deal um, because it didn't show that great. The tenant was still in there, but he still wanted a really short lease back, um, but didn't want to commit to the deal. Um, also, like, it just wasn't able to inspect because it was just piled high of used appliances. So um, there were so many different factors that you just kind of had to take. And in that reflected, the risk reflected the price point. And so uh, this was a second, it's about 20,000 square foot. These have a little bit taller ceilings, about 20 foot clear height um, and, and more uh, position to distribution, but it was a short sale lease back about six months. Um, and that he just needed to transition out. Um, and then, you know, it would be vacant from that point on. And so that was the second investment. And once again, that was through a broker. We worked together and it was an as is. I was super aggressive coming from the residential style of things. So I was the first offer in, the first person to see it. Um, and we negotiated a really good deal. So as, have they since left then? Yes, they are. They have left uh, in February, March, and it is now on the market and hopefully I'll find a tenant soon. So, um, yeah. And so how's the process going with uh, with leasing? So because I think this is a, a major question that comes up from a lot of people is that they say, well, what happens if we get a vacancy? So now you have this property where it's one single tenant in there and it's become vacant. And I think that's probably concerning to a lot of multifamily owners who might own call it like a 10 unit apartment building. One tenant leaves is probably not the end of the world. But now you have an asset where 100 percent of it just went vacant. So what's the process in now trying to find another tenant? Yeah, so the normal marketing ch uh, channels and then the networking with her and brokers too. Um, and so what I like about it is that I knew that there was going to be a vacancy. So you had to hold back or at least, um, you know, account for that vacancy. It would be very negligible if I was like, oh, yeah, this is a six month, uh, you know, sh uh, short lease back and, you know, no reserves. And so I actually have uh, six to eight months worth of reserves if it goes vacant for that long. Um, and so it is scary. It definitely is. But at least if you know it from the beginning, um, you can account for it and you can also, you know, build that into the price point. Hey, listen, it's only a six month lease back. I'm going to have this vacancy and it could be upwards of six to eight months. Um, I'm going to need a better price point to inflect, uh, you know, the risk that I'm taking on. And so we were able to have that conversation and kind of go from there. And once again, that value add deal. Um, so I'm still doing a, a office renovation. There are some aspects of, of things that I need to demo and make it a little bit better, clear height and better. There was a mezzanine space that I'm thinking about demoing and then maybe even punching out a great door. So there's a value add component to it also. Um, but really it just depends on the lease uh, or the, the tenant coming in. And so I will say that um, 
you know, I, I thought that maybe it would have been leased out a little bit sooner. Um, I, we're still getting some showings. And I thought that I had, we, there was an LOI that was kind of back and forth and we never came to that table and it was just like, ah, uh, it, it's kind of frustrating, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that if, if it's not a question of if it's a question of when and at what terms. Well, what you're doing right, and, and I think this is what anybody that's considering getting into industrial real estate should pay attention to, is that you knew that that was coming vacant and you prepared yourself by having a reserve. I think that there's far too many investors out there that probably stretch themselves too thin. Maybe it's buying their first house or buying a multifamily or buying the first industrial property and they stretch as far as they can uh, and they leave themselves too thin. And I think if it does get to a point where it stays vacant longer than you would have expected, uh, that can be really stressful if you don't have those reserves. So I, th I think that that's something really to pay attention to on, on how important that is. And, and it just help, it helps you sleep at night because you don't ha have to worry about that, that stress that's in there. Uh, so a, a question came in from Matthew. Matthew, congratulations. You won the uh, second copy of Creating Trinity. And we still do have more things to give away. But uh, what I'd ask you for, Matthew, is if you can connect with Darren on LinkedIn uh, and then just get his uh, connect with each other and get your uh, uh, information over to him, he can send that over to you. And uh will be the same thing with the rest of these books uh, and other things that we give away uh so if you're tuned in we have two copies of industrial intelligence that we're going to give away as well from justin smith and then some industrial real estate uh stuff as well uh so we'll tee that up right now as well uh the next two questions that come in for darren will each get a copy of justin smith's book uh so any question you want anything you want to ask darren put in the chat and you'll win a copy uh but matthew congrats on winning the book and thank you for the question as well what are some red flags with regards to in-place leases for you when you're going through due diligence on a property yeah so a lot of the leases that i've looked at um you know they're drafted by by different people and once again i kind of specialize in local credit tenants and so um the guarantee is going to be something that is key is it business business guaranteed? Is it personally guaranteed? What are kind of the things that the actual assets that they hold? Um, some other things is that sometimes it's not explicit in the triple nets. Um, you know, I've seen a couple leases where it's capped, you know, hey, the insurance caps at this much, the uh, property taxes uh, capped at this much, and you're not able to increase it as much as you want. Another thing is just on the base rent, um, you know, is it in line? Is it maybe a little inflated so that they can compress the cap rate and get a better, high, higher price? Um, so those are kind of the things that I start to look out and you know it is it is it more like is it kind of like an art form yeah it's kind of an art form because there's so many different things including um you know you know access and ability and different things along those lines and then how far of an option did they have to you know actually communicate um it could they could just tell you 30 days before that they're not going to be releasing it for another five years uh versus you know some some leases say hey you need to tell us six months in advance or something like that so um i would just say get Ron Rohde to, uh, to look at the lease for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, get, get a lawyer to look at the lease alongside of you and, and kind of see those potential red flags. But yeah, I would say for me, it's base rent. It is what is the recapture of the triple nets? How long of the lease? Are there any bumps? Different things like that. And so mostly it's financial for me. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I love the shout out to Ron. I don't know if he's tuned in or not, but a good, good shout out to Ron. Uh, so yeah, great answer on that. And yeah, I, I guess I, th what I would add on on that as well is I, I always like looking at a property as if it were vacant. So everything that I've bought myself, I've always gone through that exercise of what is this property worth if and when the tenant leaves. And to your point, Darren, if you go through that exercise, you can really determine if that lease rate was artificially bumped up like you said, was did they get a bunch of free rent at the beginning to have a higher face rate? There's there's an economic incentive that owners have to prop up that base rate uh, because if you just go through a basic appraisal measure of capitalizing that rental rate to come up with an estimate of value, there's an incentive to have that number high. And it's it's whether it's $10 a square foot or $12 a square foot, 
That might not look a whole lot on paper. I don't like two dollars a square foot. There's almost something psychological about that not being a big number, but that can have a huge impact on the valuation of the property. And worse so if the market really is ten dollars a square foot and the, they're paying twelve. If you can only lease that for $10 a square foot when they leave, you've just wiped out a considerable amount of value. So yeah, I think that's, that's a really insightful point, Darren, is to uh, just check, make sure, is that rate actually commensurate with what market says? And then I think that that puts you in a much better spot to uh, to be successful on that. Uh, another question came in from the uh, flip side. Thanks for joining in and congratulations uh, on winning the book. And Wyatt, uh, just before we do that, can you throw uh, Darren's LinkedIn in the chat uh, as well? Uh, so for those who win the copy of the book, if you can just connect with Darren and send him a note so he can send you the book. Uh, the flip side asks, what are some things that are really excited that really excite you about getting into the industrial space? Great question. Shout out, Brandon. He's one of my friends. He's here in uh, Tulsa. So thanks for the question, hey, bro. Brandon. Thanks for... Uh, Thanks for joining in. Yeah, so there's a lot of different things that are really excited about uh, the industrial space. So I would say uh, very, very quickly, uh, the macroeconomic side of things. I just think that on a 10-year scale, some of the bigger factors, including e-commerce and onshoring, are going to be really key uh, for different different places on a national scale, uh, macroeconomic. And then we're already seeing that in Oklahoma. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of oil and gas manufacturing. We just announced at the uh, Tulsa Ports a huge billion dollar uh, solar panel manufacturing facility. Uh, and that was just announced like yesterday. And then I hear rumblings at uh, Mid-America Industrial Park, potentially another, uh, you know, EV kind of style green energy thing. So I'm excited about that. So one, I think the rise of e-commerce two, onshoring. Uh, and then on the personal level, what I really like about industrial is that one, it's not super saturated. Um, if you looked at multifamily, mobile home parks, self-storage even, like REITs are just gobbling all that stuff up. And so on the local level, when it comes to not the Amazons or the FedExes, you know, you still have a lot to play with. Um, if you think of the 20-year-old um, that that's really passionate about or really pursuing a career in industrial real estate, can't really think of that many 20 or 30-year-olds that are trying to pursue this. Second is I like owner-occupants. So a lot of my kind of sales skills was sitting across the table at a kitchen table um, negotiating on the house that they owned. And so owner occupants not only gives you a different exit strategy. So, you know, for example, if I can't lease out that property that I that we just talked about, I'm going to position it for an owner occupant that's vacant. Um, and hopefully be able to get a higher dollar per or price point per square foot uh, for someone that actually wants to house their own business in there. Um, so that's uh, a different uh, exit strategy, but then also you're able to talk to, uh, you know, arguably the, the, the biggest generation that's going to be retiring in the next couple of years uh, for manufacturing. And, you know, they might not want um, to be a landlord. And so you can get some creative ideas. You can also, you know, have the delta between not just an investment, but also make that money in between there. And then the third point, I forgot that third point, but uh, I would say triple net leases. Yeah. So triple net leases compared to modified gross in residential where, you know, I'm having to fix the HVAC, different things along those lines. Uh, that, that's really, really a key point for me. So I know predictably what my NOI is going to be. And then minus that mortgage is going to be my cash flow. Um, it's very predictable and you can still gain a lot of influence on a personal side. So once again, macroeconomic side, that's kind of the, the driving force of what's happening in, you know, uh, industrial on a macro level. And then on the, individual side, this is what I like about it because I can influence it in a really good way to get some really good deals. What well, about you, Chad? Yeah, I, I, I'd echo everything you said. So one stat that I like going to is there's about 21 and a half billion square feet uh, worth of industrial real estate in the US alone. And if you look at the biggest player in the space, that's Prologis. Prologis has about a billion two square feet in their portfolio, but that's also all across the world. But let's even just assume that that was just in the US. The largest single owner of industrial real estate only has a 5% market share uh, of all the industrial space out there. So I, I see that there's still a tremendous amount of, of room to consolidate. I wouldn't be surprised if we see more REITs or more institutional funds come up and buy more of these, these properties and aggregate them all. Uh, and to your point, and then this, I, I have the same, my portfolio is virtually the same as yours. I don't own the 
200,000 square foot distribution centers. I own small low manufacturing properties or flex buildings. And that there's not a lot of competition in there uh, for all the reasons that we talked about. It, it can be very overwhelming and daunting trying to get into a space that you don't really understand. And, and it takes time to get into it. But it's that barrier to entry is actually very powerful because it limits the amount of capital chasing those assets. Uh, so same thing. I love the uh, the net lease element of it where uh, all expenses, operating level expenses at the property level get passed through to the tenant. You know what your rates are. You can have tenants that are much more invested in it. And I think one one thing that I'd add as well is, is just even leasing to corporations. There's something comforting about where I would rather lease to a corporation than lease to a family. And it's what happens if something goes wrong. If Are, are you going to be comfortable kicking out a family because they're not paying their rent? Well, maybe. Maybe it just gets to that level. You treat it as a business. But that's that's still something that would weigh on me. Versus if it's a company that is not paying their rent, it's contract law. We don't have all this burdensome, uh, heavy-handed government that usually sides with residential tenants it's usually just governed by contract law so what the lease says is what can happen and you're dealing with companies so instead of like a family that just has maybe living paycheck to paycheck you're dealing with corporations that can have a considerable amount of money and retained earnings so like there's there's a lot of reasons that i think industrial is is lucrative but I also don't want to just gloss over the fact that there's there are potential problems and there are things that that can go wrong. Look at all the time you spent working on that sale lease back where it didn't come come together. Uh, well, let's let's talk about that because I I, I always I always run the risk of, of sounding like a fanboy when it sound, comes to yeah. real estate because I I've gone so far as making like my own keychains and coins. Like I am a huge fanboy, but I also think that it's worth discussing some of the things. Yes, we're going to give away two of those coins uh, in a minute here as well. Uh, and uh, oh, another, oh, Raphael just asked a question. Let's get to this quick. Raphael, congrats on winning a copy of the book as well. Uh, uh, Industrial Intelligence, please connect with uh, with Darren and he'll get a copy of that. The, I don't know if Wyatt's put that in the chat yet, but it is in the description, uh, Darren's LinkedIn. So please connect with him. Congrats on winning the book. Uh, list of potential candidates to lease. This is this is a fun one, Darren, because it, it, it actually... Actually coincides you put out a, a, a linkedin post as i was making a video on this topic uh, about weird tenants that we either have in our own portfolios that we've come across uh so let, let me just tee it up real quick and then maybe we can just talk about some of these more interesting ones the, the biggest ones are going to be big distribution companies third-party logistics 3pls big manufacturing companies, those are going to take up a, a lot of the space. And those are the ones that most people are going to be pretty familiar with, like an Amazon or a FedEx or Boeing, at least in a 4 million square foot in, in Everett, Washington. Those ones are like more common, but the the fascinating part is just how many different types of tenants there are in here. Uh, Darren, why don't you list some of the funny ones or not even, maybe not even funny because it's they're still all viable businesses, but just more of the interesting ones. Yeah, definitely. So I would go ahead and check out that video on Chad's YouTube page. It is hilarious. And then also, yeah, it, I, I never thought that in, in industrial real estate, uh, how diverse a group of tenants can be. Because I thought, you know, usually in my mind, I was like, okay, I need to be able to present it to someone or, or make it available for the contractor or something like that. So let me like try to get this space prepped for that person. But you really won't know what type of tenant is going to try to lease out your space. And so some of the funny ones that I have are interesting ones to say the least um, include uh, crematory manufacturer. So they don't actually cremate bodies, but they service the, the machines and hospitals, vet clinics, um, you know, actually funeral homes and stuff like that. And so they have a pretty big, you know, you know, kiln, I guess is for, for lack of better, pretty, pretty, uh, you know, uh, for lack of better words. Um, and they manufacture that they service them, make sure that they're able to be, uh, uh, used. Uh, the second one, I just recently leased to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. And I think that maybe you were in the heyday of CrossFit. So I'm guessing maybe you probably placed a couple of CrossFit tenants. But yeah, any exercise gym kind of garage space where they kind of build out. Um, you know, I just recently went to a birthday party where uh, a ninja warrior camp and they do like different trainings and stuff like that with kids. Um, they built out a space with like a big giant climbing wall and like all those ropes then the, like uh, the salmon bar too. So um, that's really fun. And yeah, I just placed that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and they're moving in uh, on the first. So I'm excited about that. Um, another one, gosh, uh, 
Get the hummus uh, one. The hummus one, the hummus distributor. So yeah, this guy, this company, they make hummus in Texas. They ship it in a refrigerated fan and then they built out, and this is another sticky tenant. Uh, they built out an actual freezer or refrigerator space inside a warehouse and that's used by Freon. And so they just distribute hummus to the local grocery stores because it's something that spoils and, you know, it doesn't, it has a shelf life and, you know, different things along those lines. And so, yeah, and it gets consumed too. Um, so every Monday through Friday, they come out at 6 a.m., deliver the hummus to the uh, grocery stores and, the, and then kind of go from there. Um, yeah. And then my friend recently just placed a pickleball tenant. And so they're just, indoor pickleball, almost like a gym membership. You, you kind of sign in beep, you, you, you kind of go from there and they're able to play pickleball. So, um, but other contract, uh, other leases or other tenants include like HVAC plumber, electrician, you know, cabinet maker, different things like that. Something that you would maybe think on a light industrial flex building. So yeah. Chad, why yeah. don't you go ahead? You had an interesting list too. Yeah. And, and I think that's just one of the cool things about industrial is that it, it is very versatile and it can accommodate a lot of tenants from, even if you just look at it from the standpoint, it's, it's really a box. So if you have a, a wide open box with high ceilings and typically you can find properties that have good amount of parking uh, and the rates are often a lot less, maybe, maybe offices changed fundamentally maybe office space is cheaper than it used to be but even look back like three years ago if you're looking at an, an, a warehouse space and call it, it was ten dollars a square foot or you're looking at an office space and it was double that and then the operating costs were even more it all of a sudden those industrial look pretty appealing to someone that can go and operate out of an industrial building and build out maybe a little bit of office or have an open open area with with a bullpen so it can be accommodating for office. I have a building, a flex industrial building, zoned industrial. Uh, we have an office tenant in it. They're 100% office. We have a furniture store. We have a cabinet store in there, a hot tub store. We just put a flower shop in there. And then we have another, uh, an equestrian store, which just sells equipment to people that ride horses. So that's that's an industrial building. It's it's a fully industrial building, but we have a flower shop in it. So I, I, I think that that really is, uh, interesting. And on that video, what I love about it is people have been putting in their, their funny businesses that they've, they've come across. And there's, there, uh, Gordon, who has his own podcast, he put one in about, uh, it was a, a facility that just treats over, overweight dogs. That's, that's why I don't know if they do dog therapy or dog i don't even know what they do like i i have more questions that i have to ask gordon about that one but it really can like industrial if you're creative and you think outside that that proverbial and literal box uh you can come up with a lot of fascinating uses and uh because industrial is going to be generally a lot cheaper than retail Anyone that needs some showroom space, because you mentioned like all the home improvement ones, uh, even just think of all the companies that do that do flooring or uh, furniture is another good one because they usually have a showroom, but they need to have a bunch of stuff at the back. Uh, there's there's so many uses out there, and and that's one of the reasons that I always encourage people that are getting into industrial or considering industrial is to actually just go and drive your industrial park, spend a Saturday. Uh, take two hours where these industrial parks can be pretty slow and just go drive up and down the roads and pay attention to all the different tenants in there. It will be a mind altering, uh, uh, activity where you'll just be like, I never knew that uh, these businesses existed. And, and I still find interesting ones as well. There's a one that I went to uh, the other day that they just serviced arcade games. Uh, so they had 50 different arcade games, like Pac-Man and everything you can imagine. And when those things broke down, they had, someone had to fix them. So yeah, it's, there's a, there's a ton of different uses on that. But I, I did want to circle back to the point about some of the negative things on what people should be prepared for or where things can go wrong. And just before we get to that, though, Darren, we'll do the next giveaway. So some industrial real estate coins. Darren, you got one of these. It's pretty weird. I don't know if they'll focus or not. It's a pretty weird coin, uh, but it's it's very cool. Oh, that was a good focus on your camera. And then also some keychains and... Uh, I'll send these as well. I'll tell the story about these coins another time, but it's it's pretty cool. So next to people that uh, that ask a question, leave a comment for Darren. I'll send you a copy of these as well. Uh, but let's jump into what what are some things that perhaps keep you up at night, or what are some things that you would caution industrial investors to be concerned or worried about? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so some of the, the differences between residential and industrial include, it just takes a little bit longer time. And so I'm used to kind of really fast motions, different things like that. But the, the you know, I kind of alluded to earlier, a failed LOI, you know, I showed it, everybody was really happy. We, they sent us an LOI, I sent them back, da, 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 da. And it just took a month in between communication. And then ultimately they just kind of ghosted me and I thought I had a deal across the table. And so um, some of those things that keep me up at night include environmental problems. Um, you know, you don't really see a ton of environmental problems in the residential space. Make sure you get your phase one, phase two, if, if necessary. Um, but yeah, that can absolutely just kill a deal and it could be underground like a tank or something like that. Um, some other things include, yeah, you have to have the patience, at least on the bigger, uh, single tenant net leases. It is really binary, almost like a single family home where it's, Hey, uh, basically, uh, this is like equivalent to 10 single family homes. And if it doesn't get leased out, I'm not going to have that income, uh, or the even covering debt service too. And so, um, things just take a little bit longer time. Um, also, some of the challenges include uh, industrial real estate has really become hot over the past couple of years. So deals are harder and harder to get and harder to pencil. And, you know, once again, you have that delta, which could you could use for your advantage. Uh, but sometimes, at least here now for different facilities, um, you know, the owner occupants uh, garnering a better price point than the, the, cap, the investments. And so, you know, anytime a broker has a, a property, they're going to try to get that owner occupant in there. And, you know, for an investor, they're not going to be able to do that. So it really is uh, getting a little bit harder to pencil deals. Also, you know, it is scary if a larger tenant leaves. Um, and then once again, another third point that I'll say is that a lot of my tenants are local credit. And so, you know, if you have Amazon signing, you know, Jeff Bezos is going to pay up because he has to. But, you know, if I have Joe Schmo, the plumber, um, his asset is really his business. And it's going to it might be hard to go after him, even with a personal guarantee. Um, it might not be worth your time either. So um, sometimes you're playing that uh, that that uh, that dance there. One thing to even add on that as well is that presumably Jeff Bezos would pay, uh, but Elon Musk uh, is not paying his rent uh, for his office space in San Francisco right now. And they they have a contract and I'm sure the landlords will, will sue and I'm assuming that they would get a successful judgment on that. But in the meantime, they would have all that period of time where they're not making any income and they're not even get, collecting the operating level expenses on the property. So that's a far out case. I love Elon. I think he's his, some of his business practices are a little peculiar, uh, but that that could be an example as well as that you might even have a big company that that does say you know what well, we're not paying anymore you can come sue us for it so that that is just something to keep on the radar i'd say it's very very rare uh but that is another possibility let's you mentioned the part, part about time and i think this is worth going into as well is just that due diligence period on so you find a deal. So let's say you found something came across your desk right now. You wrote a contract on it. You got it accepted. You're going to have a conditional upon a number of things. Environmental being one, probably want to get a property condition assessment, likely need an appraisal. You might need to have your Ron Rody look over your lease. T talk to me about, because this, this is also something that most people would probably under be underprepared for is just the time process and even the costs of, of getting these reports. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, depending on the style and how hot your market is, sometimes you don't get the the due diligence that a lot of people do on the front end too. And so, um, yeah, the time aspect is pretty crazy, especially if you're a sole operator like me, because I'm trying to raise the capital stack, get the financing at the same time and doing all these things. But basically the due diligence, uh, sometimes it's a little bit longer, but sometimes it's a little bit shorter depending on, you know, the contract and what that states. But you have uh, upfront cost to you check if there's environmental issues. And so you don't get re reimbursed by that. Um, you have, yeah, the PCR, the property condition report, and you pay out of pocket to see how old the roof is, if the HVAC is, you know, on its way out, if it needs Freon, different things like that. Structural engineer, sometimes you need a PE to come in, a professional engineer to come in to tell you, okay, the water grades and this concrete needs to be replaced, blah, 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 blah. And the, and the upfront due diligence cost plus then the time cost can be really, uh, it's definitely not like a single family home where you're paying a couple hundred dollars to get an all in report. And then, you know, that might be the only um, 
you know, payment that you have. There's a lot of different nuances too. And then appraisals are more expensive. Surveys are more expensive, different things like that. It wouldn't be uncommon for me to spend 10 to $15,000 on the due diligence process. And, and, you know, that's a sprint. And especially if you don't have a team like I do, you know, that is, you kind of drop everything and make sure that you have all these things set in order. And then on top of that, I'm trying to raise the capital stack. So I'm having conversations with investors to see if they would want to invest alongside of me, having conversations with the bank too, to make sure, you know, especially nowadays, what the interest rates are going to be and, you know, what, what terms can I get, how much down payment that I need. And then sometimes the goalposts are moving all, all and every single time. And so, um, yeah, that, that's a really fun thing, not including, you know, the legal side of things, which is, you know, it, it, you know, I haven't done this, uh, you know, you do maybe a, a tenant common or uh, a joint venture, not a lawyer, by the way. So you have the lawyer drafting the operating agreement to then, you know, form the LLC and doing all these things. So you're running all these concurrent lines, spending money at the same time, as well as your time. And, you know, just like I kind of mentioned before, there's a lot of deals that bust, um, uh, and, and, you know, hopefully you retain your earnest money or have that contract within the, the time frame to be able to do that. But, um, yeah, it, it is not uncommon to spend a lot of money to not go anywhere. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you went into that so deep because I think that is a key point is, uh, sometimes there's reports available. Like you might be able to find a property where they recently did an environmental or, and the, ter- I know the terminology varies across markets. Uh, so we, we usually call them BCAs, b- uh, building condition assessments. You call them property condition reports. Was that correct? So the, the yes, terminology right. varies, but you're, you, the essence of that is you're having someone go through and check all the major components. So they'll check the roof, they'll check the HVAC, they'll check the electrical, and then they'll also give a guideline on how how long those are supposed to last the lifespan of it and then what it will cost to replace that that's kind of the intent of those can vary from market to market but uh, those reports can be considerable considerable and they take time so it's not uncommon if you're running through all those reports that you're four to six to eight weeks uh, and then you're trying to arrange your financing and everything else simultaneously it's it's a lot to juggle and it just takes time so for anyone getting into industrial I think we've beat home just how how much we like industrial, uh, but there there are things that people need to be prepared of. So the last thing we'd want is someone to be like, okay, changing everything, we're going into industrial <laughs> uh, and not being uh, prepared on that. So thanks for diving into that. Uh, I, so I want to, I guess, transition. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so again, if you have any questions for Darren, please throw it in the chat. Still giving away two, uh, two packages. And if we don't have any more comments come in, in live, I'll also extend that to just comments that come in uh, after the fact. Um, but uh, with the time we have remaining, are you focused still on Tulsa? Is that major? Oh, I kind of went out of focus there. Uh, is that the major area where you're going, or are you going to consider other markets? Yeah. So as uh, uh, right now, uh, especially with some sharp increase of interest rates, I really have to put kind of my strength behind each investment. And so right now, geographically, I am just looking at Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I wish I had a little bit more capital and more influence and be able to raise more capital. If I was, um, and I think that I will be in the next three to five years, I will be either uh, doing one of two things. I'll be looking at industrial in a geographic location, including Oklahoma City, maybe Northwest Arkansas, maybe Kansas City and Dallas. So something close, you know, within four hours or a very quick plane ride. Um, Or, you know, I could Uh, double down on the geographical niche that I have, which is Tulsa, and maybe invest in different asset classes, very similar, potentially, uh, you know, something maybe like a grocery anchor, um, you know, strip mall or something like that. And so those are kind of the two paths in the next little bit. But as of right now, uh, my residential portfolio and my uh, industrial portfolio is just centered around uh, Tulsa and their surrounding suburbs. How big is the industrial portfolio now? Yes. So we have a little over a hundred thousand square feet and we're under contract. Um, and it's just, it's just crazy when you prospect and when you try to turn over rocks and you get creative deals, we're under contract for about 40,000 square feet right now. And I think that it will probably close in the next, uh, hopefully a couple of weeks. And so that'll be fun. Congrats. Well, I, I look forward to, to, I'm hoping you do a video or a post on that. Cause I'd, I love hearing about uh, other deals that get done. I just, I find this so fascinating how, how people like yourself uh, and others just look at deals, find a way to do it. And, and even though there's that, 
interest rate dominates so much of the news right now, there's still a lot of people per, uh, proceeding and trying to do deals. Uh, so I, I really commend you for that. You had an idea right before we jumped on, and I think that this could be a, a, a natural way to end. All. You, had, you had a few questions that you thought we, we could just pose and, and maybe get some people to, uh, to participate as well. If you're, if you're ready for that, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot because I said I didn't know if we'd have time or not, but if you're ready, why don't you tee one of those up? Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting because uh, I, I, I watch short form content and, you know, sometimes it pops in my feed of NBA players and they're kind of guessing or like, who would you rather have Michael Jordan or, you know, LeBron or, you know, whatever the case may be. I wanted to pose to Chad and also the chat, what would they want uh, when it comes to investing? And so I put this one on LinkedIn and we'll start pretty easy. So would you rather have 10 free and clear single family homes or 50 multifamily units, but levered up same amount invested, different things like that. Would you want leverage or not? Where are you at Chad for a residential at least? Uh, I would take the 10, 10 homes. Uh, if for no other reason, then I, th I think that it'd be a lot easier managing 10 tenants than managing 50. Although that 50 is probably at the level where you might be able to hire a manager, uh, whether you can just, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I, another reason I love industrial is you can scale so much easier. So it's, you can add a hundred thousand square feet, much easier of industrial than you could in, in residential. Uh, so I, I management intensiveness is just very difficult for me to wrap my head around because it just takes so much work and takes your eye off of, of doing other things. So that that's why like my mind just naturally went to less management as opposed to even any investment metric beyond that it was just less management. What about you? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I think I would go. So it's interesting because uh, probably about a year ago, I would say the 50, uh, you know, 50 multifamily levered up. Uh, but yeah, same thing for you. I, right now, it's just like, uh, I, I want the least management so that I can focus on the strengths, which I think include the deal making and different things like that. But yeah, thank you, chat. Thank you, Simon, for uh, commenting. Uh, it's just interesting to see where people are in their career and, you know, different things like that. But yeah, if it was industrial, uh, if it was, you know, free and clear industrial, I would choose the levered up industrial for me personally. So yeah, feel free chat to uh, kind of just comment below and uh, maybe a reason why or something along those lines. So I know I follow you and you said that if you were to invest, you would want to be somewhere in Texas. So this one's going to be spicy. Would you rather have, you know, for your next investment, uh, would you rather be in Texas or Florida? That's a very good question. I, I would go Texas first, Florida close second. I'm, I'm just a big believer in population growth. I think population growth is the single biggest demand driver for industrial real estate, because as you have people coming in, they consume things, they buy things, they order things online that all just needs more warehouse space. That's not the only metric I, I should caution as well. There are other things to be import uh, that are to take into account, but population growth, I, I just, I can, well, that's, that's why Dallas is going crazy. Dallas has 65, 70 million square feet under development. That's a medium sized industrial market in itself. They have that under development. And I think that's because so many people are seeing these net immigration trends into Texas. I would probably go, I personally, I think I'd go outside the major markets. One, one that's really interesting to me is Corpus Christi. So small little town south of Texas. Uh, it just so happens to be, it has port access and it's also on the main line for Kansas City Southern, which just got bought by CN, CP, sorry. So that new rail line creates a single rail, a, a main line rail network connecting Mexico, Texas, US and Canada. So I, I think we're going to see a, a shift in rail patterns going from that historical east to west, now going north and south. So you got that Corpus Christi, kind of a little bit of a sleepy beach town, a uh, vacation town, a vacation city that hasn't really had a whole lot of industrial growth, but they've port access and it's going to be right on that main line. I can see that. And, and it's, it's not getting the same press as Dallas or Austin. So I, I would go Texas first, but Florida wouldn't be far behind for the same reasons. Everyone's moving to, to Florida. Yeah. So I think for me, 
uh, the Texas, Texas has a lot of space. So there's going to be a lot of development, just like what you mentioned, seven, almost 70 million square feet. Tulsa, Oklahoma alone has like 140 million. So basically they're building half of our inventory right now. Um, so it's kind of crazy. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at Tol uh, Dallas unless, um, you know, there, there's some really great connection, but, um, yeah, I like Texas more than I like Florida, but on the flip side, Florida has less space, especially, you know, when it comes to their population growth and where some of those bigger cities are located. Um, yeah, but I, I would go Texas personally too. Um, but yeah. Okay. So next question. So this one's, uh, kind of funny. Uh, I don't know where you, uh, it seems like people like distribution more than warehouse. So the, the question is, where is that tipping point where you want district, uh, aware, uh, excuse me, um, a manufacturing versus distribution. So I kind of pose the question, would you rather have national credit tenant, um, 10 year triple net lease with a distributor or a 13 year lease with a manufacturer? So kind of where's that tipping point for Chad? And then same thing, Chad, you guys can uh, kind of look along those lines too. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, lo I love the the thought you put into these. On that case, I would probably go with the warehouse uh, for the sole reason that most often warehouses are cookie cutter. So one warehouse is going to work very well for the next warehousing tenant where those manufacturing properties, there's often a lot of customization that goes into those. So I'd have to dig into it deeper. I'd have to, because the same thing with the manufacturing property you bought where the tenant put in 500 grand, that's, that's sticky. They're, they're likely going to stay in that space. The challenge comes, and this is where I'd, I'd just have to dig into it deeper is how is it built out? How is that manufacturing property built out? Uh, are there a lot of customization that's specific for that one tenant? Or is it fairly ubiquitous where the next manufacturing tenant could move in and, and operate pretty quickly? I'm, as much as I love projecting growth and seeing how, how much things can go, I also am uh, very psychotic about downside risk <laughs> and downside risk to me is, is way more important than upside uh, because I, you can have a manufacturing property that if it was heavily tailored to the tenant that's in there and they leave, you can be crushed trying to retrofit that for the next tenant. Uh, it can be very difficult where as a warehousing one, it's just need another warehousing tenant. Like it's, it's, it's much more compatible across different uh, businesses. Whereas manufacturing can be very specific to one user. So I guess I'd have to look into it more, but like I, on, on a basis, I'd, I'd much rather just have a, a simple warehousing spot that I know I could always lease out. But kind of like a multifamily, right? If you have a multifamily building and a vacancy comes up, you're always going to be pretty comfortable that you can rent it out again. Uh, warehousing is probably the closest to that in industrial. Where, where do you stand on that? Yeah, yeah, I see both points, and I think that you you, you nailed the 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 nail on the the head or whatever that that phrase is <laughs> called. But yeah, usually the warehousing is just a big box. How many pallets can you store? Uh, it's not as customized, so it doesn't necessarily need heavy power. There's usually, I mean, maybe sometimes the racking system is robust, but um, if you kind of switch it on over to the manufacturing, yeah, usually those tenants are sticky. They have big machines that cost a ton of money. They have to shut down operations, different things like that. And so I wasn't sure if three years was enough to kind of tempt you to go on the other side. Maybe it was a 15 year, maybe. So I'm kind of interested to see that, that uh, where, where that, where that kind of lands with, with uh, some of the, the people out there and same thing for you guys in the chat too. Um, I would probably land with the warehouse also just based on, um, you know, I think that there's going to be, uh, the e-commerce is going to be growing even though there is the wave of onshoring. So uh, I like the warehousing tenant more. Yeah. And I see why it's uh, trying to wrap us up because we <laughs> hit, hit an hour on that. Uh, just a couple notes. I saw Simon, you had a question in there. Uh, what I'll ask Darren to do as well, and I'll also do it, uh, is we'll reply to that to your question in the chat. Uh, so thanks for that. We will I'll also send you a copy of the, this, uh, the industrial coin and keychain. It's, it's pretty cool. It's uh, I spent a lot of time designing that coin. So I'll, I'll, I'd love to send you one of those. I'll just need your contact information. Uh, if you could uh, email me uh, chad at industrialize.com, uh, I'll get that out to you. And then first person to leave a comment uh, on the video, I'll send, I'll also send another one of these uh, little industrial real estate packages. So 
Simon will will answer your question. Really do want to thank everybody for joining in and the the questions on that. Very much appreciated it. Uh, mostly Darren, thank you once again for jumping on and uh, and sharing so much insight. I'd love to keep this conversation going and and have you back on in the fall uh, just to see how this one uh, uh, development or purchase that you've got going. I'd love to hear more about that story and just dive into it further. Uh, Mark, great, uh, Mark. You just won the next uh, merch prize. So uh, thanks for the comment on that. I uh, really do appreciate it. Uh, Mark, if you could email me your contact info as well. And if you guys like this uh, interview, please hit the thumbs up button. If you didn't like this, if you didn't like our answers on this, or if you, we didn't talk about NBA on whether it'd be Michael Jordan or LeBron James, that could have influenced <laughs> it. I'm a Michael Jordan guy. So if you disagree with that, you can leave a thumbs down. We like feedback of any kind. So uh, comments, thumbs up, thumbs down. We really do appreciate it. Darren, once again, thank you so much for your time and look forward to chatting further. Okay, thanks everybody.